land, lots of land under starry skies above. Don't fence me in. Let me ride through the wide open country that I love. Don't fence When the Emperor was divine by Julia Tsuka, chapter titled When the Emperor Was Divine. All through October, the days were still warm, like summer, but at night the mercury dropped and in the morning the sagebrush was sometimes covered with frost. Twice in one week there were dust storms. The sky turned suddenly gray and then a hot wind came screaming across the desert, churning up everything in its path. From inside the barracks, the boy could not see the sun or the moon or even the next row of barracks on the other side of the gravel path. All he could see was dust. The wind rattled the windows and doors and the dust seeped like smoke through the cracks in the roof, and at night he slept with a wet handkerchief over his mouth to keep out the smell. In the morning when he woke, the wet handkerchief was dry in his mouth, and in his mouth there was a gritty taste of chalk. A dust storm would blow for hours, and sometimes even days, and then, just as suddenly as it had begun, it would stop, and for a few seconds the world was perfectly silent. Then a baby would begin to cry, or a dog would start barking, and from out of nowhere, a flock of white birds would mysteriously appear in the sky. The first snows fell, and then melted, and then there was rain. The alkaline earth could not absorb any water, and the ground quickly turned to mud. Black puddles stood on the gravel paths, and the schools were shut down for repairs. There was nothing to do now, and the days were long and empty. The boy marked them off by one on the calendar with giant red X's. He practiced fancy tricks on the yo-yo around the world, walked the dog, the Turkish army. He received a letter from his father written on the line sheet, on thin line sheets of paper. Of course we have toothpaste in Lordsburg. How else do you expect us to brush our teeth? His father thanked him for the postcard of the Mormon tabernacle. He said he was fine. Everything was fine. He was sure that they would see each other one day soon. Be good to your mother, he wrote. Be patient. And remember, it's better to bend than to break. Not once did he mention the war. His father had promised to show him the world. They'd go to Egypt, he'd said, and climb the pyramids. They'd go to China and take a nice long stroll along the Great Wall. They'd see the Eiffel Tower in Paris and the Colosseum in Rome, and at night, by the light of the stars, they'd glide through Venice in a black wooden gondola. The moon above, he sang, is yours and mine. The day after the FBI had come to the house, He'd found a few strands of his father's hair in the bathtub. He'd put them in an envelope and placed the envelope beneath the loose floorboard under his bed and promised himself that as long as he did not check to make sure the envelope was still there, no peeking was his rule, his father would be all right. But lately he'd begun waking up every night in the barracks, convinced that the envelope was gone. I should have taken it with me, he said to himself. He worried that there were large messy people now living in his old room who played cards night and day and spilled sticky brown drinks all over the floor. He worried that the FBI had returned to the house to search one more time for contraband. We forgot to check under the floorboards. He worried that when he saw his father again after the war his father would be too tired to play catch with him under the trees. He worried that his father would be bald. From time to time they heard the rumors of spies. Takazawa people whispered, was a government informer, possibly a Korean, not to be trusted. So be careful what you say. Yamaguchi had close ties to the administration. Ishimoto had been attacked late one night behind the latrines by three masked men carrying lead pipes. They say he was providing the FBI with names of pro-Japan disloyals. What do I miss the most? The sound of the trees at night, also chocolate, and plums, Mama. You miss plums. That's right, I miss plums. I always miss plums. Maybe not always. True, maybe not. There's something that's been bothering me, though. What is it? Did I leave the porch light on or off? On. And the stove. Did I remember to turn off the stove? You always turned off the stove. Did I? Every time. Did we even have a stove? Of course we had a stove. That's right, the Wedgwood. I used to be quite the cook once, you know. Slowly the boy spun the dial. He heard organ music playing on the Salt Lake City station. Then rumba music. A swing band. 
an ad for Dr. Fisher's tablets for intestinal sluggishness. Folks, a man asked, do you feel headachey and pepless in the morning? Nope, said the boy. Then the news came on and the Western Task Force was landing in Morocco and the Central at Iran and in the Pacific Islands, the American forces were dying all over the place. He closed his eyes and imagined himself fighting with Hank and the raiders down in the Solomon Islands or flying reconnaissance over Mindanao. Maybe he'd take a direct hit over late and he'd have to eject. He'd float slowly down to earth beneath a flaming silk parachute and land softly in some bushes or on a white sandy beach and General MacArthur would wake up, would wade up onto the shore and give him the purple heart. You did your best, son, he'd say, and then they'd shake hands. Now when the girl undressed, always the quick flick of the wrists and then the crisscrossing arms and the yellow dress billowing up over her head like a parachute in reverse, she'd ask him to turn away. She told him about the seasons and hibernation. She said that any day now she'd be bleeding. It'll be red, she said. She told him that Franklin Masuda had a terrible case of athlete's foot. He showed me and that someone had stuffed a newborn baby into a trash can in Block 29. What did it look like, the boy asked. You don't want to know. Yes, I do. She said that Miss, Mrs. Kimura was really a man and that a girl in Block 12 had been found lying naked with a guard in the back of a truck. She said that all the real stuff happened only at night. The boy said, I know. One night he found her squatting outside beneath his window with a tin spoon from the mess hall. I'm digging a hole to China, she said. On the ground beside her lay the tortoise. Its head and legs were tucked up inside its shell and it was not moving. Had not moved in several days. Was dead. My fault, the boy thought. But he had not told a soul. Night after night he had lain awake waiting to hear the sound of the scrabbling claws, but all he had heard was the banging of a loose door in the wind. She placed the tortoise in the bottom of the hole and filled up the hole with sand, and then she shoved the spoon deep down into the earth. We'll dig him up in the spring, she said. We'll resurrect him. He was there above his mother's, uh, he was there above his mother's cot, Jesus, in color, four inches by six, picture postcard someone had once sent her from the Louvre. Jesus had bright blue eyes and a kind but mysterious smile. Just like the Mona Lisa's, said the girl. The boy thought. He looked more like Mrs. Delaney, only with longer hair and a halo. Jesus's eyes were filled with a secret and flickering joy, with rapture. He died once, for you, said his mother, for your sins, and then he'd risen. The girl said, hmm, she said, that's divine. Late at night, in the darkness, he could hear his mother praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, and in the morning at sunrise, coming from the other side of the wall, the sound of the man next door chanting, Kokyo ni teshite kere, salute to the imperial palace. Now whenever he thought of his father, he saw him at sundown, leaning against a fence post in Lordsburg, in the camp for dangerous enemy aliens. My daddy's an outlaw, he whispered. He liked the sound of that word, outlaw. He pictured his father in cowboy boots and a black Stetson, riding a big, beautiful horse named White Frost. Maybe he rustled some cattle or robbed a bank or held up a stagecoach or, like the Dalton brothers, even a whole entire train, and now he was just doing his time with all the other men. He'd be thinking these things, and then the image would suddenly float up before him, his father, in his bathrobe and slippers, being led away across the lawn. Into the car, Papa San. He'll be back any day now, any day. Just say he went away on a trip. Keep your mouth shut and don't say a thing. Stay inside. Don't leave the house. Travel only in the daytime. Do not converse on the telephone in Japanese. Do not congregate in one place. When in town, if you meet another Japanese, do not greet him in the Japanese manner by bowing. Remember, you're in America. Greet him in the American way by shaking his hand. None of the other fathers had been taken away in their slippers. Ben Okada's father had been arrested in his golf shoes while practicing his swing on the lawn. Woodrow Tashima's father had been arrested in black wingtips and a rented tuxedo at a Buddhist wedding in Alameda. And Sugar Sawada's father, who had already lost a foot and some of his memory, 
Only the bad ones, Mrs. Sawada had always insisted with a friendly wink and a smile. In the First World War, had bowed once toward the east before being hauled away drunk in his single black boot, waving his crutches and shouting, Banzai! 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 Sometimes the boy comforted himself with the thought of Tommy Tanaka's father, who had been wearing uh, white toe socks and an old pair of wooden getta when the FBI caught him red-handed in the garden cutting down last year's chrysanthemum stalks. Getta, the boy decided, were worse than slippers. Much worse. Sometimes, said his mother, I'll look up at the clock and it's half past five and I'm sure that he's on his way home from the office and then I'll start to panic. It's late. I'll think to myself, I should have started the rice by now. The trees appeared suddenly and without warning on a sunny day in late November. They were willow saplings trucked in on flatbeds from some faraway place, the mountains perhaps, or the banks of a river, some place near the water. Excuse me, some place there was water. Where there was water. All day long the men in each block planted the trees in front of the mess halls and at evenly spaced intervals along either side of the fire breaks. Sweat covered their brows as the broad blades of their shovels twisted and flashed in the sun. At the end of the day, when nobody was looking, the boy plucked a small green leaf from a tree and slipped it into his pocket. The next morning he put it into an envelope and sent it to Lordsburg. Land, lots of land under starry skies above. Don't fence me in. Let me ride through the wide open country that I love. Don't.